Spain looks a bit in this history in a way. He sees human cultures and their attendant civilizations so much like the morphology of plant life. Their things have a natural cycle. They have a brief flowering, they have a spring, they have a summer, they have an autumnal phase, then they have a winter of the soul, and then they die. They literally atrophy and die. His belief that cultures can be seen to come to an end, or they can lie fallow for enormously long periods prior to some renaissance, is deeply troubling to the modern mind which is addicted to the idea of progress and progressivism. Spengler's emotional register was profoundly optimistic, and he once said that optimism is cowardice. And there is a degree to which his view of history, which is these radial circles that overlap each other like a Venn diagram in mathematics, accords very much with his own view that things are circular and cultures go through various stages which are inevitable, and each stage follows from the other one and has the seeds of death in its own mouth in the sense that the thing would turn to a circle on itself and decline away to merely being of archaeological interest. These are forbidding and sort of almost totalitarian insights of pessimism, which don't accord easily with the 20th century. The book like Neil Ferguson's The War of the World, for example, an analysis of the extreme violence in Western and global society in the 20th century, is an apocalyptic book. It's a book which in some ways is opposed to the idea that things are getting better and better. Yet at the same time, it doesn't feel emotionally pessimistic. Ferguson remains an optimist in a sort of liberal methodology, the belief that things can get better even if they turn out for the worst at a particular time. Spengler believes that cultures are sort of caged in a way and will wither and die just as they sprout up to beauty in accordance with the rhythm which is closer to that of biological life. It's important to realise that for a proportion of critics, Spengler has not just been an asthma, but has been fundamentally mysterious, because there are quite a few philosophical schools that believe that it's utterly pointless to have attempts at historical analysis which are non-linear and which seek for an answer to the conundrum of history the nature of historical reality. They consider that there is no plan, there is nothing other than linear motion, and any attempt to find a historical plan is fruitless. Consider the decline of the Roman Empire by Gibbon, where you have an enormous unfolding vista of historical time, that the end is partly the projection of the beginning, so you have almost a biography of a society. That's acceptable. What isn't acceptable is to try and find a philosophical agency to history, to interpret history. That history has a meaning in the way that Thomas Carlyle believed that history had a meaning in the 19th century. And Spain is addicted to finding a meaning in history, which pulls him outside of several of the major historical schools to begin with. There's also the fact that he is self-taught and was a sort of autodidact and a sort of gifted dilettante, as somebody not completely kindly once said. So in two areas, academicism and search for ontology in history, the belief that there is a prospective future which can be determined, those lie outside of Spengler's purview and yet make marginal his historical essay, his attempt at finding ultimate meaning in things in the two-volume enormous work The Decline of the West, published in 1918 and 1922. He draws on primary idealists like Hegel, but I don't think there's much comparison to be found, because Hegel believes that history will reach its fulcrum and its termination in the idealistic presentation of the Prussian state, whereas for Spengler, the Prussian state is just a part of the West, doomed to decline, as all of the great civilizations, the Arab, the Eastern Chinese, the medieval, were doomed to decline in their way. He thought cultures were um, self-enclosed and were organic, although they had a period or an expanse of time associated with them. He sees the Middle Eastern culture as essentially magical, sterile, introverted and flat in the culture of the desert. He sees Greek culture as proportioned and massive in its sort of architectural and classical relief. Less dynamic than the Western culture, more staid with a tendency towards a preternatural order. The Western culture, which he's most keen on, he sees as a partly diabolical culture, Faustian, the mismatch and a matching of things that don't go together in other cultures. 
conceded to the culture of immense restlessness and absence of an inner sense of ease, and with an extraordinary desire for self-transcendence, the desire to change everything again and again and again, to make it new and make it work, and make the Western culture the most dynamically aggressive culture on earth. It's a sort of civilizational construct of culture articulated by the masses. It's racially based to an extent, but only partly so, because his positions are sublimated racialisms, whereby, although the Semitic largely goes with the Modian and the Eastern Mediterranean largely goes with the Apollonian, and the Western is made up of most of Europe associated with Western imperial conquests, North America in particular, the notion that they are purely racial is not one that he accedes to. He has a Nietzschean concept of race, which is that race is important, but it's too rudimentary. For analysis, you have to look at the culture and the civics which are created by specific races over time, and pure biology is not enough to describe man's ascent, if indeed it has been an ascent, rather than a withering to death of prior and knowledge cultures. So, Spengler's always an unhappy bedfellow for various people, because he never fits in with um, people's preconditions and prior suppositions. There'll always be a tension, even with the racialist right with Spengler, as there is with the left over his pessimistic and non-materialist views of history, his intuitionism, his opening to the subjective element in culture, his belief in the wintering of the soul of a culture and its partial decline over time his obsession with decadence, all of these would not render him attractive to a left-wing mind at all. But at the same time, the liberal progressive sees little in him, the man of the centre, because he's too morbid, too mordant and pessimistic, too professorial, and too linked to a prior theory which cuts against their ingrained optimism that things are getting better and better. He thinks that after the collapse of the Roman Empire, the classical world comes to an end in the medieval world as such begins. The medieval world is a static and enclosed civilization, which is a magical one based upon totem and taboo, and based upon a stiff and regulated cosmology that is only unsettled by the return of classical wisdom in what becomes the Renaissance. And the Renaissance inflames the entire civilization mentally and culturally, and sends an enormous coursing torrent of energy through it, which leads to an unfolding of new visions and new vistas, whereby we see the Middle Ages replaced by a post-medieval Europe that looks back to the classical period based upon the solidity and the transcendental magianship of the Middle Ages. And it's the Renaissance and the scientific methodology that gives rise to it, which is the return to a particular intellectual inheritance of the Greeks that gives man this diabolical pact element in the Western cosmos. This is the idea that Faust will literally sell his soul to Mephistopheles for knowledge. He will sell his soul for power over given things, for the power of magic almost in the interpretation of physical reality and his ability to hold sway over the physical world with which the sciences are concerned. And Western man begins a transmutation of everything in life, of every science, of every art, of all forms of economic dealing, all forms of culture and civilizational intent are recalibrated and cast anew through this prism of Christian fire. And this enables the West to set out as the Athenians had once done in a restricted Grecian compass to conquer much of the known world and to subdue it to their own restless tasking and desire for self over becoming at every possible instant. So the West is seen as the culture of the Superman in Nietzschean terms, reaching out across the world, reshaping other cultures, interacting with them in often destructive and creative ways to release more energy, to enhance more transcendence, to enhance more creativity, to lead to more Faustian pacts and bargains, and then to become even more enraptured of its own colossal strength and vigor by importing even more energy through even greater and deeper and more residential fast impacts until the thing teeters on the brink of absurdity to a degree because the West becomes so enamored of its own model that it can't see that it's beginning like all cultures to engage upon ineffable decline. He believes that everything is pre-programmed like a computer chip to decay over time. So you can only go to the well so often 
Hmm. The Enlightenment is seen by most Enlightenment thinkers as a precursor of the Enlightenment. But he doubtless sees the Enlightenment as the giving way of the Faustian bargain to decadence, to untrammeled ideas about the rule of the majority, which the people who put them forward, he believes, must know are absurd, because the majority of men can never decide any question of any importance amongst themselves. But then women will be given the vote and will be allowed into um, the function hall of the male. The liberal humanism that would increasingly refuse to distinguish between patterns of being and hierarchies in nature as they express themselves in society. So really, it's the Enlightenment and its definition of the West, which is necessary, because my reading of his codex of history is that the decline is necessary and therefore is inborn, and the forces which are there, rather like illness and death in the individual, are there to permit change in the future and the ending of a cycle which is natural, as it is in the biological world. So he doesn't see decadence as a disaster, he sees it as a necessity. At the end of the Khan in the West, in the second volume, he preaches a new Caesarism, that there will be a democratic Caesarism, which of course came to be true throughout the first half uh, of the 20th century. His view that democratic niceties would be replaced by a much more Machiavellian and realistic politics, the politics of ruthless real politique associated, even though he never advocated it, with fascism. Some of his political sayings are close to that of a fascistic or fascist or conservative. That's why, again, he falls between two camps. He's not fascistic enough for those people who are enamoured of those governments, movements and regimes. But nor is he conservative enough not to be associated with them, at least through nostalgia. So he's too quasi-fascistic for many conservatives, but he's also too conservative for thoroughgoing fascistic types. And that was his attitude to one of the most notorious governments in the Western world that you lived through the early stages of in the 1930s in his own country. There's always been a, a liberal qualm here as to why he didn't support the Nazi regime. He did vote for Hitler against Hindenburg in the presidential election, which of course Hitler lost. Hindenburg retained the presidency until he died in office. But after the clash out, it was just rolled up and it became one of Hitler's many offices as he became supreme leader of all elements of the state. And the officer president and chance to amalgamated into that of the leader figure. He also put a swastika outside his lodging windows to annoy the neighbours with his sister, saying if he unfilled it, that one should always do, prepared to pay the price for annoying people. But at the same time, he thought of them as irretrievably vulgar and without high culture, very much Ernst Younger's snobbish intellectual attitude towards them. He wasn't so much bothered about the social origins of many of them, which is what convulsed the German old right, in which Spengler would have been more comfortable. But he was concerned about their cultural ignorance and the greatness and glory of what it was to be German, seen in cultural terms. In some ways, he's too stark and too elitist a figure just to make mouth-watering speeches about Germany. What do you mean by Germany? What do you mean by German cultural identity? Unless you're highly educated, civilized, and knowledgeable about what it means to be German or to be European in extenso, these political remarks are slightly meaningless. His one intervention into politics when he was attempting to get the power for a German on Ludendorff's general staff during the First War, General von Schick, I think, didn't really go anywhere because his view of practical politics was probably overly conspiratorial and sort of overly verified. Like a lot of academic intellectuals, he didn't make a good politician. But at the same time, although he despised the Weimar Republic and regarded it as an unnecessary appendage to the glory of the German Empire which had preceded it, he was actually Actually, not particularly enamoured of the Germans, partly because he believed they were too hostile to other European peoples, when he believed that the coming battles were civilizational and there should be alliances with other European nation states against the hordes of Asia and Africa and the Far East that would be the real enemies in the future. To a leftist mind, he's almost as right wing as Hitler, but he doesn't agree with his views, just as an enormous number of left-wing intellectuals, of course, didn't agree with Stalin. So there's a degree to which he also didn't entirely agree with the aggressive technological features in the Third Reich, which was romantic and realist and agrarian at one level, and yet embraced motorways and rockets and high technology at another, because he believed that technology had become a part of enslavement for modern man, very much preferred 
also bring Heidegger's thinking in this regard. And also, of course, he didn't share the anti-Semitism either, particularly. While in no sense being philo-Semitic about Nietzsche, he didn't share the crude, jew-baiting, beer hall attitudes that swirled around the German right because he didn't view the world conspiratorially. He viewed the world in terms of these great overarching abstractions of cultural civilizations of which Germany was only a part. He also was a pessimist and he didn't share the extreme and rather myopic optimism of that regime, which was very shrill, particularly on its own behalf. He sounded the death knell of an ever-present West who was exhausted at the end of the Great War. His thesis was misunderstood. The tens of thousands of coppers that made him from a penniless, living in genteel poverty, intellectual, into a sort of major cultural figure throughout Germany and the West was based on a misnomer. The mass of cultured people who bought his enormous book and some of the others only made him moderately wealthy as a consequence and able to live independently. They interpreted the book as an explanation for Germany's defeat in the First World War and because it basically put it into world historical and cosmological terms, it exonerated Germany from a personal defeat but also seemed scholarly and well-wrought, and was not propagandistic. It was not the stab in the back mythology. It was not the fact that they'd been let down by forces at home. Nor was it the normative liberal view that they'd just run out of men, run out of material, run out of resources, and been defeated in that way. So people flocked to his book really on the misnomer, because what he was saying was that Germany's defeat was part of a pattern of defeats that were going on within the civilization at a particular time. He posited the idea that these defeats could be arrested for a time by various forms of populism for which he had a distaste, actually, but which he believed to be necessary at this time in the cycle. And in Manning Technics, for example, there was a quite ruthless extolling of the virtues of some of these sorts of regimes up to a point, but he never thought that they were um, the be-all and end-all for culture. And so his belief is that the West would continue to decline throughout the 20th century. And one of Spengler's offshoots, of course, is the doctrine of the clash of civilizations. Now, that's a Spenglerian thesis, even though he may not like to admit to be influenced by Spengler, some people don't choose to. You have all sorts of people like the Beats on the left, or metacultural left, let's put it that way, like Barrows and Ginsburg and Kerouac, who openly admit to being strongly influenced by Spengler. But other people are very reluctant to even admit the fact that he's come anywhere near them and their thinking at all. Nevertheless, the idea that other civilizations will rise, particularly in the Far East, and will challenge the West's hegemony later in the last century, don't forget he died in 1936, is indisputable from the nature of his work, but he doesn't go on to specify it very much. The second volume of the time of the West basically closes on the turnaround of the democratic Caesarism and the fact that the West is going into an autumnal and wintry stage and leads it to that. But lots of people, of course, take up the mantle. Jockey's views are strongly Spenglerian, even though he fills in Spengler's work by essentially giving it a National Socialist register. In some ways, Jockey is a Nazified Spengler, because Spengler was never a whole hogger, as far as they were concerned, and actually had a different viewpoint. That's why Jockey's book tends to be two books in one. 80% of it is a Spenglerian exercise, and then at the end, the 20%, when he basically adopts the sort of uh, Fourth Reich, Third Reich viewpoint, which is his own grafting onto the Spenglerian architecture of a sort of neo-national socialist opinion or uh, editorial. Yeah, I personally think that if there is to be a revival, it probably has to be more classical than anything else, and has to be a return to the verities of the Greco-Roman world as uh, at least a cultural basis and a starting point for thinking, because that provides you with a pre-Christian as well as a post-Christian dynamic. It's rational. All of Western high culture has the Hellenic stamp upon it, filtered through Rome, Christianized, and Germanicized that came after it. And in some ways, it's a common appeal to the inner tensions in Western man that can be resolved classically. So that's for the inner reasons for Grace, of course, the Benoist outfit, calling itself the group to research into the origins of European civilization and culture. They want to go back to Greece with modern technology, with the hallmark of the new West, and they want a new right rather than an old right to carry that project forward.